Hi folks, welcome back to the channel. Thank you very much for joining me once again and a happy new year to all my viewers and subscribers. This I think is my first review of the year, first video of the year of 2024. So happy new year to everybody. I hope you're all well. Um, actually I've not been very well so I won't bore you with it, uh, but I haven't been very good over Christmas. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to go into details, but I've not been, not been great to be honest, but um, hopefully I'm on the mend, I think. Anyway, let's move on. Something... <laughs> A slight elephant in the room, I'm going to have to get out of the way here. Well, we know from my uh, review Kits of the Year show that uh, I did mention about this. This is the one, new, brand new, the 148th Blackburn Buccaneer S2B. So this is the new um, 48 scale kit from Airfix. The RAF uh, bomber version, if you will, ground attack version of the aircraft. Um, an aircraft that was based at... Uh, RAF Huntington and, and also RAF Lossiemouth, we'll get into that in more detail. But this is late, this was supposed to have come through before Christmas and I did allude to this. There was an issue, uh, I think I've got to the bottom of it now. Um, I've had response from Dale Luckhurst, who's the head of brand at Airfix. Um, so basically what happened was, uh, four days before Christmas, these popped up saying they were now available. And if you had a pre-order you'd be charged and, and it'd be going out shortly. So I rang up just to clarify this and they said, oh, it'll go out in the next 24 hours. Obviously, depending on what, you know, the shippers, DPD do, etc. Should be with you for Christmas. They didn't actually guarantee it, but they said it was definitely going to dispatch. And that didn't happen. And that was a bit of an issue, I think. Uh, so I was chasing it up again and then I couldn't get any sense out of anybody. I uh, chased it up between Christmas and New Year. Did speak to customer services manager, who was very helpful, I must say. Very nice people. Uh, Airfix Hornby and Margate but she didn't know anything and unfortunately everybody else was on holiday and they just couldn't get to the bottom of it what had happened. Now my beef with this isn't that it's late, well I, I'm annoyed it's late, yes I think I think we're all disappointed that it's late. I think it was held back a bit, Dale hasn't got in, he hasn't clarified that unfortunately. Um, I think a lot of this stuff came in on a shipment um, early December but we shall see, I don't, I don't know if that's true or not but that's what I believe. Whether it did or it didn't, it was certainly here on the 19th of December and was supposed to go out. And what has happened is they took the money from people and then didn't dispatch for two weeks. Now I think that's completely unacceptable. I've now had an explanation which is basically, I'll, get, I'll share it with you because it's important. So the explanation uh, from FX is that um, the reason it wasn't shipped was they were going to send out, which is very nice of them, you know, I don't want to knock anybody for, <laughs> for, the, for their good intentions. And they're going to send out this most beautiful commemorative coin that goes with the kit. Uh, and this is for people that did a pre-order. They get this beautiful thing. And it is a gorgeous. I'm very impressed with it, actually. An absolute stunning little... Uh, this lovely... I don't know if it's made of... What well, it's made of? It's pewter? Or, well, it can't be, can it? I can't believe it's that valuable. But it's got Airfix on the back. It's probably ceramic, maybe. Um, but it's Airfix on the back. Again, beautifully painted. And then on the front, you've got the... 12 Squadron, the Foxes, the Buccaneer, which is exactly the squadron I'm going to depict. And it's, and it's a numbered thing as well, so if you look very carefully, uh, if I can get it into focus. We've talked about this, haven't we? My focus problems. It's number 90 out of 500, this particular one. And it is gorgeous, so I am very uh, grateful that that's been included. Um, especially me, uh, and I'm just going to say, before I, before I come off this subject, uh, Perhaps nobody's better qualified, well, there will be better people that have been on Buccaneers or flown them or maintained them. But I used to live uh, next to RAF Huntington, I used to go to school at Huntington School. Um, Huntington was the, for 12 years, was the only RAF, not, not Navy, but RAF Buccaneer base in the UK. Um, and so I was very familiar with these aircraft and saw them every day, quite literally. Uh, every working day, certainly. And, and so, you know, in some respects... Yeah, this is why I've got a big bit of a passion for the aircraft. I also think it was a very good aircraft, even though it wasn't. It ended up replacing the TSRT and all that stuff. But anyway, nobody's better qualified as a spectator, not being in the RF myself, but nobody's better qualified to, to give you a review on this one because I've seen them. I've also, I've also built them. I've also built them. Oh, we'll get into that in a second. Um, anyway, the, the point is, um, this, this coin that I've just shown you, which is a beautiful thing, uh, it really is nice, I'm going to keep that, it's a collector's item. Um, the, the, these arrived late, I think, from what I've been told by Airfix, and therefore they couldn't be dispatched altogether. So they held back the kit, and this is my, my irritation. And I've, I've, I'm not saying anything on camera that I haven't already expressed to Airfix, so it's all above board. 
Um, but I think that they should have either um, refunded the money and just said to people there'd be a delay because we'll wait for these coins. That's the good news, you know. People, I think people have been happy, but they didn't. And they had, people, everybody that had paid had an expectation, especially if they'd spoken to them like I did, that they were going to get these before Christmas and it never happened. And in my case, of course, I was doing my top 10 kits of the year. So it ended up being defaulted out of that, which is such a shame. Such a shame, yeah. I'd rather have had the kit without the coin, frankly. And I like the coin, as I say, it's beautiful. But I'd rather have had that maybe sent later or you could send it with another shipment or at some point in the future. The fact that they delayed it into another year, you know, I know it's only two weeks, but yeah, I'm disappointed. Disappointed that they would take your money. Here's the bottom line, as I said to FX. Customers that, that and, the, and I know several others that are in the same boat as I was, they took your money, you got no money, you got no kit, and you got no information for two weeks. And I think that was a bit unacceptable. So I'm saying it on camera. I've said it to FX, exactly those words. I've said my piece. I'm going to objectively review this. I promise you that the irritation that I've got there will not influence my review of the kit one iota. Because I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, if it goes into kits of the year, if it's a really good one, it'll be kits of 2024 though, not 2023. That's just the way it is. Anyway, we're moving on from that. So I do say to Airfix, thank you for your explanation. Not entirely happy with it as I've expressed to you already, but we'll leave it at that, I think. Um, I don't know what to say really. I, th I think that mistakes are made, yeah? Bad communication, lack of forethought, and I think they should have got this out, you know, very shortly, probably only five to seven days after the gannet, they should have released this well before Christmas. Not all the other stuff that, they, I mean, there's lots of others that were just released as well. Are we to believe that they all came in on a boat on their own? Meteors and bloodhounds and all that other stuff? I don't think so. Anyway, don't want to be critical. I just want to. I just want to say, no company should be taking your money and then holding on to the goods. Can you imagine their year of end figures must look fantastic? We've got all this stock, we've got all these assets and we've got all everybody's money as well. No, you don't do that. You don't do that. That is, that looks bad. Anyway, I'm drawing a line under it. So, new year, new start. Let's get cracking. Now this aircraft was, of course, the aircraft that replaced the TSR2, it didn't really replace it, did it? Because it wasn't, it was never intended as a high level, uh, heavy duty nuclear bomber. It was nuclear capable, of course, um, but it wasn't going to carry the same sort of payload the TSR2 was going to carry. It wasn't intended to be a, you know, fly all the way to Russia like TSR2 would do during the Soviet era. Um, TSR2 got cancelled, of course, we all know that. Um, another connection with me, of course, because my father went to work for BAC, specifically because he wanted to work on TSR2, and as he, about a week before he was due to start the new job, the government cancelled the project. <laughs> he was lucky he kept his job, he wondered it wasn't cancelled, but anyway. So this aircraft really filled in the gap, and the RAF ended up getting it, um, I'm not sure they were entirely happy with it, because they initially thought it was a maritime aircraft, which it was designed for, and was brilliant. In the end, it turned out to be an absolutely brilliant aeroplane and exceeded most people's expectations because, although initially it was a bit disappointing they had a, the wrong engines in it, once they got the right engines put in here, um, the, the aircraft was brilliant. It was great at low level. It was very relatively stealthy, not in the modern sense, but it was great at low level attack over water, over land. Uh, it carried a fairly good payload. It was not supersonic, only just not supersonic. It was very fast. Uh, and it had a lot of um, very pilot pilots speak very highly of the Buccaneer. They all liked it, you know. And it had great aerodynamics, low drag, quite a, quite an underrated aeroplane in the world, actually, in the history of aviation. One of the most underrated, frankly. And the fact that it ran from, I think, in the naval version, it came out in 1961, which is early if you think about it, in the navy. And it ran, and it was still, you know, Operation Granby 1990. Well, 30 years later, it was at war. Absolutely incredible running out. So it's a, a proper aeroplane to be fully appreciated and let's get straight into it. So Airfix's kit number is a 12014. Let's zoom you in and we'll have a proper look at this. Lovely artwork, looks like it's uh, perhaps, perhaps it's over Scotland there. Looks like Scotland to me. Um, I guess it's, I'm guessing it's Adam Tooby's handiwork. It's certainly a nice bit of art. Um, not much on that side, but over on this side, um, and there is one thing I may I may end up criticising this kit for. I think it's to do with the markings actually. So I think I'm getting to that now. 
Um, oof, got a lot of reflections there, haven't we? So, we've got Buccaneer, 12 Squadron at Lossiemouth in 93, which is very late, just before they retired them. Um, we've got Larbrook in Germany in 71, 15 Squadron. We've got 208 Squadron, Red Flag in 77. Now, it says Red Flag, but that is actually an RAF Honington aircraft, which it doesn't say. Uh, and then we've got Granby, um, Operation Granby in 91, which I alluded to earlier. Now, I've got a slight... I'm going to get my beef out of the way here. Two beefs about the aircraft model. One isn't about this, one is about the earlier version. Ooh, get to that in a second. You'll enjoy that. But my beef is that they've gone... That red flag says red flag, it doesn't tell anything else. It was actually RAF Honington, which is... Um, Former RAF, uh, it's still there, it's, uh, I think it's now the RAF Regiment and Training Centre. But it used to be a tornado base as well when they replaced the Buccaneers in 81, 82. Um, but I lived there uh, in the, let's just say, early 70s. Oh. Um, and basically, um, Airfix's previous iteration of this in 72nd scale, I didn't mention Honington. And they never do a Honington version. It was, it was the only RAF squadron of, of Buccaneers for 12 years. And I found it really weird. They always go with this lossy mouth option. That is, in fact, a Honington one, but it doesn't say so. And it, I'm not even sure if the researchers knew that. And I've had to now go out because I've been waiting and waiting. So I've gone out and actually got myself a Kits World set with four Honington options. Uh, and it's got some lossy mouth ones as well. He says, Larbrook, is it? I might be wrong here, actually. No, it's Larbrook and South Africa. So there's no lossy mouth options on here, because Airfix seem to just carpet bomb as though they... It's almost like they don't know it was at Honington. Lossy mouth, you know, previously didn't have them. Um, well, it did have them in... Sorry, that's quite... That's not quite correct. Lossy mouth had the Royal Navy versions. It was an RAN, RNAS station, Lossy mouth, previously. Uh, back in the 60s. Um, and they had the Royal Navy versions come in in 63, I think it was. Um, but the only RAF contingent, RAF squad, was at Honington, so I don't know why it's couldn't have included that, make that a bit clearer, instead of having all these multiple lossy mouth ones. Anyway, there we go. Anyway, I've got some nice, I'm, I'm fine, I've got my 12 Squadron Foxes. We'll talk about that another day, perhaps. So let's get into it. But before we do open the box, let's just talk about its predecessor. Ooh, now that really was not Airfix's finest hour. Here it is. Not really my finest area model building either, but hey, he can't, nobody's, nobody's perfect. So here we have, this is the 19, came out in the late 80s, I think it was it, late 80s, early 90s, from memory, I didn't check on scale mates, but um, a proper, I mean, it looks all right, doesn't it? It's quite a decent looking one, and this is actually, um, this is the RAF fairing, obviously, um, but... Not a very not a very pleasant build. This this is the one that got into my um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I named it as my least favourite build of all time. Not the worst kit, but just the, the worst experience I ever had was probably this. Um, it had this problem where it has this top and bottom uh, fuselage, very unusual design, and and a lot of them like mine were bent like a banana. A lot of warpage. A lot of issues with the way it was, I think it was a lot of it was to do with the moulding, not just design really. And not a pleasant kit to build, you know. I've seen very many, I mean mine's decent, I don't think it's outstanding or anything. But mine's quite a decent one, you know. Um, I think I did the cockpit very nicely, just uh, zoom in a bit more for this. I did the cockpit okay. But... It never, you know, it was such a battle. One of my, one of my great battle kits where I had to fight through and and defeat it in the end, and it, it was not an enjoyable experience, and never recommend that kit to anybody. So today's kit is its replacement. Uh, today's kit is designed by Paramjit Sembi, who of course is one of Airfix's great stars in the design team. Um, he designed the uh, the Navy version, which came out last year, two years ago now, because Airfix let it slip into another year. So it came out in 22. Um, so I'm, I'm very confident this is going to be a really good model, if not one of the greats, you know. Anyway, I'm going to move this. It looks nice, I know, but it wasn't. It, you don't buy the old kits. Do not get the old one. It's a disaster, quite frankly. You will not have any pleasure building that thing at all. So let's get into the new one, see what we got. Let's uh, so find my knife. This is straight from the, the nice DPD man. What's say nice? <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
see what we got here. Now I've been looking forward to this so much, which is another reason I was a bit disappointed about the lateness really. Uh, and it says BA Systems, of course, is the trademark that they've got because it's now. It was Blackburn, then it was Hawker, part of Hawker, and then it became part of BAE in the 1980s, of course. Design and tooling is 2022, decal schemes and pack design 23. So it's two years late, isn't it, really? Okay, it, there is a long gestation period, and you have to be shipped, and we've had issues with the Suez Canal also. As well. I do hope that Airfix can get things through a little bit, a little bit sooner. Oh, it's big. Oh, okay. Now I haven't seen. Bear in mind, those of you that are chuckling, I haven't. I never reviewed the the Navy version. This is my first of the Paramjet Buccaneers. So, and I've been waiting for it specifically because it's in separate bags. We've got two sprues per bag. It looks like. That's good. That's good. That's good. Two sprues. Two sprues. Two sprues. Yeah. So we've got six in total, and then all the lossy mail they come. <laughs> right. You'd probably say he's a right moaner, isn't he? But the fact is, yeah, I can't really understand that about the the lossy mouth thing. It's it's like a, it's like they think that it'll never operate without a lossy mouth. It's just a little bit a bit of a shame that its history hasn't been fully appreciated. Right, I'm going to start with the decals here because even though they are lossy mouth, we're going to have a look at them anyway. Uh, we've got some uh, seat belt decals, almost Tamiya style here, which I've got to say, I'm not. I don't really mind. I don't know if we've got pilots. We'll get to that in a minute. I don't really mind. Uh, I know a lot of people don't like them. I think that in a jet, fast jet, hmm, don't know. Don't know if it's that important, really. Don't know. Um, I mean, these are. Are they cartograph? Pretty sure they are. Pretty sure they are. Um, you've got some very. Oh my goodness. Oh, there's some slightly uh, raunchy. Uh, nose art for the <laughs> for the Operation Granby version with Guinness Girl, who looks uh, a very impressive young lady. We've got Sky Pirates, of course. This was all part of the Operation Granby. Um, is it Sky Pirates? No, I'm wrong. I'll take it. it is Guinness Girl, not Sky Pirates. Okay, so that's a different variant. Uh, still an ex-Lossy Mouth gang, though. Um, and then we've got strangely, we've got these two. Vulcan markings. Vulcan markings. Now what does that mean actually? We'll get into that later perhaps. I'm sure my ignorance now. I didn't I didn't anticipate having a couple of Vulcans on the side. Unless it's to do with refueling. Um it probably means that they've been refueled by Vulcans perhaps. Um Red Flag. Oh no, it's Operation Red Flag. Okay, so ah I got it, got it, got it. So what it is, it's shot down Vulcans is what they've done. I think the Vulcans have been, Red Flag have been posing as the enemy, that's what that's all about. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Anyway, Operation Granby, and then there are, I have to warn you, there are quite a lot of stencils with this uh, with this aircraft. Um, and you have got to be careful and do a better job than I did here, because you have this big day count, which I wish the cannon wouldn't do it like that. I think I, if I were you, I'd cut out some of this, because it's very tricky, you've got to make sure uh, this area, there's no walk area on top of the engine covers on the top of the fuselage. You've got to make sure that that's good and glossy when you put your your decals down. Because I got silvering, you may have spotted that. I got a bit of silvering on mine, unfortunately. Over here we've got the the 12 Squadron, which is the ex Huntington Squadron that moved to Lossy Mouth, the Foxes. And by the way, there was um, um, I don't know that's to do with Huntington itself, but um, 12 Squadron and the Foxes, that was actually um, the name of the local pub in Huntington. Yeah, the fox, <laughs> which I've, I've been in and enjoyed a pint in several times in the past. Not when I was at school, though. <laughs> right, okay, well, those are very, very nice indeed. I can't see any, any problems there. Just perhaps, well, I'm saying that, I'm just going to zoom in again. I'm not trying to be critical here, but it, again, you've got a lot of um, carrier film. You need to tr sort this on these here. See that? So, we've got, might be a good idea to cut between those. Or separately cut out those uh, numbers and letters because there's a lot of carry film there. And again, if you've got a really glossy surface, I don't think you'll have a problem. Uh, but if you've got if you've got it a little bit more satiny, uh, you might encounter some issues there as well. So just be wary. That's all. I'm not going to make that as a complaint at all. Just put my beautiful coin. That coin is actually very nice. I would say. It's the first time I've had it, any of those. I'm always a bit sceptical about things like that. I think they're a bit of a gimmick, really. 
but in fairness to FX, you have executed it really nicely, so that's off to you, fair, fair comment. Credit where it is due and all that stuff. So, a lot of plastics, you can screw you big, aren't they? That's a monster. Right, so over here we've got our coloured call-out, that's we'll have a look at. Two-sided. I do like the way FX are doing this, I've got to say, this is very Tamiya-like. Um, yes. Um, who else is doing this that we reviewed recently? Was it, uh, was it Meng? Was it Tamiya Meng? Somebody else was doing it. Anyway, we've got here Aria Flossiemouth, as Swell Squadron. Uh, equally, it could be the same markings, could be true of Honington, actually. Because I don't think anything changed apart from the location. The markings look the same. Um, and we've got Sea Eagle Missiles, which is the anti-ship missile. Uh, and you've got, obviously that's the wraparound camo scheme, which is very nice. Then you've got the larva, the earlier scheme. This is the sort of uh, late 60s scheme where you've got the high-vis roundels and you've got the um, light sea grey, is it? Yeah, light aircraft grey underneath. In fact, I've got light sea grey. Dark sea grey and dark green on top and light aircraft grey underneath. Um, I mean, it's a very sporty-looking plane, a very aero-looking plane, the Buccaneer. It, it's kind of... It just shouts low drag, everything about it, doesn't it, you know? And of course it had this um, this design, what they call it, the area rule principle design and they had these uh, blown um, slats and flaps and all sorts of things, all sorts of clever stuff. Much cleverer aircraft than people think it is. Then we've got our red flag, which as I say it doesn't actually tell you, but it is in fact, it is in fact oper um, Operation Red Flag. But it's actually uh, an RAF Honington aircraft in 1977, that's because this is when they were still stationed at Honington. Honington, by the way, is between Thetford and Bury St Edmunds on the uh, North Suffolk border with North, uh, Norfolk. Oh, we've got some FOD. Oh, yeah. Um, FOD blanks as well. Uh, foreign Object Debris, that stands for, of course. Uh, that's good that they're included. I'm very impressed with that. Got slipper tanks, so you've got, basically, you can see where they've They've left a bit of the original camo at the back. Not quite sure what the thing behind that was. I think it was just to remind people that's its original colour. Perhaps it was for colour matching, actually. They may have done it for that reason. Well, that's nice. And then on the other side, finally, we've got Operation Granby, of course. And this is the... Um, so this is... I'm pretty sure it's 12 Squadron, even it doesn't say. Uh, out of Lossy Mouth, and then you've got all your... It is, it's Sky Pirates, I was right actually. Sky Pirates on one side, and then Guinness Girl on the other. Guinness Girl. Are those the same aircraft then? I guess they are, okay. And this is operating out of uh, Muharraq Airport in Bahrain in 91. Muharraq Airport in Bahrain, yeah, okay. It's flying further up the Gulf. Aren't they? Very nicely done though. I like those, those are nice. So that's all good. Now we have got our instructions. Let's have a read of this. We've talked about how other people do not give you any information at all. Some do, of course. Several have praised. Airfix are very good at this, you know, all fairness, and they deserve credit for it. So here we go. And it's not just that somebody's British aircraft, they do that with everything. It says, a mighty naval strike aircraft which can trace its origins back to Britain's response to a massive naval expansion by the Soviet Navy in the 1950s and the introduction of their Sverdov class cruisers, the Buccaneer was designed to have exceptional low altitude performance and the ability to effectively neutralise this new naval threat. Required to operate from the relative confined space along one of Britain's aircraft carriers, the subsonic strike aircraft was the most capable aircraft of its type in the world and a real triumph for Britain's aviation industry. It also happened to be, they say this is the last the last British, the last British bomber. The Harrier was the last British fighter, basically, don't they? Um, somebody said it was the last British, all British aircraft, because the Americans did have some input into the uh, Harrier, didn't they? So you could say this is the last all British aircraft. Anyway. It, it also happened to be the heaviest aircraft ever operated by the Royal Navy. It doesn't look light, does it? I've got to be honest. <laughs> I mean, when you see one in the flesh, they look proper heavy, they do. In order to allow its effective operation at sea, the Buccaneer's design not only included the ability to fold its wings, but also the nose radar housing, the rear speed brake could be folded back and split open, respectively. 
allowing for more effective carrier stowage. Whilst maintaining the aerodynamic integrity of the aircraft, entering the Royal Navy Service in 62, uh, 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 sorry, a lot of this is the Navy write up, anyway. Uh, entering the Navy in 62, there were no two seat trailer versions of the Buccaneer, even though the pilot would have a, the benefit of several flights as a back seat observer in the new aircraft. His first flight as pilot would therefore be his Buccaneer solo. No pressure. <laughs> the introduction of the ST variant in late 1965 saw a major upgrade. No, that's the same year TSR2 was cancelled, by the way. Saw a major upgrade of the Buccaneer's capabilities. No coincidence. Yeah. And this, it was centred around the ado adoption of the new power plant, the famous Rolls-Royce Spey turbofan engine. Possessing much greater thrust and increased range, the S2 was an even more capable naval strike aircraft, and one which must have struck fear into the hearts of every Soviet naval commander. With increased power, the S2 was now able to land back at its home carrier with one engine shut down if required. Wow. Still having enough thrust to go around again, the aircraft... Should the aircraft fail to catch the metal. The Navy retired their larger carriers in 78. Their much loved Buccaneers were transferred to the Royal Air Force, who were already admirers, well, already admirers of many qualities of the aircraft and grateful for the increase in their inventory. At its peak strength, the Buccaneer equipped no fewer than six Royal Air Force squadrons. Yeah, because there was at least, I think, four, five at, at Huntington. Doesn't really make it clear though that you know when they entered service. So I can tell you that it was, uh, I think it was 1969 they came to Honington, the RAF versions, for the first time. There you go, you heard it here from someone who was there. So, maximum speed, 667 miles per hour. Just just under the speed of sound, isn't it? 40 foot wingspan, sorry, 44 feet, and a length of 63 feet. Armament was various combinations of unguided bombs, laser guided bombs, red beard, WE-177 tactical nuclear bombs, in other words a small one, <coughs> up to £4,000 on the wing pylons and £12,000 on the internal bomb bay. can also carry two AIM-9 sidewinders or four sea eagle missiles. There we go, right! Without, where's my rent? Without further ado, I'm going to zoom you in and we're going to have a look at these instructions and we hats off to Paramjit who's designed this and we'll have a good old look at it. Now then. So it's telling you at the beginning, that's got a rip in it, hasn't it? It's telling you at the beginning, if building a scheme, you need to drill out 12 holes. A scheme being, wait a minute, it tells us here. Mm, doesn't make it entirely clear in the colour call outs, actually. Just a moment. Does it say which is A at this point? Am I missing something here? A scheme, A scheme, B scheme. Uh, is it in the is it in the neck house? Which is A B? Does it doesn't seem very clear to me that actually. Oh yes, it's there. D. It's there. So it is there. Yes, C. Okay, okay. So yeah. So when you get the when you get the kit, then you are well advised to to basically have a look at this first, decide which one you're going for, and then remember what what the number is, or the letter I should say. So A scheme, B scheme, and so on. So, we are going to drill out for you four sea eagles. It looks wicked with sea eagles on this, isn't it? I can't say I ever saw sea eagles on them, actually, at Honington, if I'm honest. I um, can't recall ever seeing a loadout like that at Honington. I think that was more of a Navy loadout myself. Um, don't get me wrong, these guys were, would, would strike at anything in the North Sea if they needed to. I just didn't see it, but there we go. Right, and then we've got four bombs going in as an option here in the rotary bomb bay underneath, which is cool. And then we've got uh, other versions, obviously, for the different slipper tanks or pylons. If you go for C scheme and then a D scheme, which is the Gulf War version, slightly different, slightly different uh, drilling required for uh, the paveway, um, laser guided system, etc. Then we've got here position of the internal decals. These are the decals. Uh, so these are on the um, ejection seats. We've got instrumentation, and then you've got. All oh right, okay. So we've got quite a lot of decals for the actual instruments. Did I miss that? I think I did. Didn't have that one. Too many, talking too much. Where was those instruments then? 
Okay. What they are, they're actually very easy to miss because um, they're just the actual dials, the, the decals. It's not a complete, you know, like Tammy, are they? they sometimes have a complete decal. It's not, it's just the dials themselves, the little round dials. So this is what they're saying, you need to paint the surrounds here first, and then obviously on the main instrument panel and the navigator uh, weapons officer in the back. And then we're going to build our, our seat. Um, looks looks fairly decently uh, detailed, I would say. Um, certainly plenty of detail on the side, we can see there. Then we're going to put in these decaled seatbelts. You've got your ejection pull handles at the top, and then you repeat that process, obviously, for the, the back seater as well. You've also got his instrument panel going in there. <coughs> then you're building up your cockpit tub, uh, which, of course, uh, on the other side has got the main gear bay. And then all those instruments you worked on are being brought in here, all those little control panels. Um, clear instruction here, this is one of the things we do love about FX, about the clarity now. Their instructions make things so, so clear. And I've been building, uh, I've been building the, uh, the Edward Zero I'm building at the moment actually. Uh, and it's a nice kit, don't get me wrong, but some, they, they present information almost back to front sometimes, some of the clarity. Uh, it's not bold enough, it's not big enough. They have these little diagrams and there's lots of space around it of nothing instead of blowing it up a bit. Don't understand why they do that. Airfix have nailed it here, to be honest. So, yeah, they can teach them a few things, I can tell you. Okay, so. Yep, so all these instruments are going in, and then you've got your, um, your stick, because it's like a, a joystick control here. Um, and then we've got the rear bulkhead going in. Uh, the bulkhead, sorry, at the back, the one that goes between the pilot and the navigator, and then you bring in those ejection seats in to, to complete your, your cockpit area. And then, this is where it starts getting clever, isn't it? So what Paramdut has designed here, because he's a modeler and he knows exactly what's required, he's designed a separate sort of capsule for your weight, so you can put in lead or liquid gravity or whatever it is you're going to put in there, something nice and heavy. Mercury. Oh, no, don't, don't do that at home, folks. No mercury. <laughs> but but you need 15 grams, um, which sounds, mm, sounds conservative. Now, I, I must tell you now, just to prove that we all make mistakes, not just in a fix, even me. I'm going to let you in on a little embarrassing little dirty secret. Did I didn't show you that, did I? I forgot to put the nose away on my original buccaneer. And if you look very carefully, how did I get round it? By cheating, I stuck a load of blue tack up the intakes, which is not ideal. Oof. Oh, amateur hour. Ah, that's bad. That's bad. Yes. Not my finest hour. I spent so much time battling with this, it just completely slipped my mind. Just getting the nose together was a major challenge. Getting any of it together was a huge, huge challenge. Um... Not making excuses there, that was that was my worst failure when it came to nose weight. So, Paramjit has done it in such a way that only an imbecile, not even I could miss them, <laughs> not even I could get this wrong, yeah, because he's got a separate capsule. So, well done, you sir, well done. You've got to, you know, legislate for fools like me, really. <laughs> anyway, here we go. So, we're doing all the uh, instrumentation on the sides and the inside of the cockpit area. Uh, inside this nose section, then you're bringing in here your capsule full of weight, and you've got your crew ladders, which you look they look really cool, aren't they? Crew ladder front and rear, and then again, uh, all your instrumentation going in on the opposite side of the cockpit, and then you're going to bring up all of this is going to come in together now in one big section as a sub assembly. And it says, well, it says click, that's promising, that probably means it's going to be a nice fit, then I hope. And it does it on the other side, it just clicks, so it sounds like it's a click fit. And then you're probably best just running around, clamping it and running around with a little bit of extra thing glue, I suspect. Um, then you've got your, your scuttle goes on here, and then you've got your gun sight going on there. Yeah, I'm not too sure about the gun sight, folks. I, I, I'd be tempted to leave that until later on. <laughs> I always think they're best put it near the end. And then we've got these, um, like this kind of a, I was going to say a jig, but it's kind of a sub-assembly for a separate um, jet pipe, and the internals on the jet pipe acting like a kind of spar, 
another one of Paramjit's sort of hallmarks is he always thinks how can we make this fit together properly and space properly without having big gaps and uh, and he's particularly good at this I'd say uh, and he yeah he's done it again hasn't he he's, he's created a, a sort of a it's almost like a framework for the spa to clip into another sort of rear bulkhead stroke spa at the back and then <coughs> at the front end um, another spa that's going to go toward the centre of the aircraft uh, and then form um, sort of the, the centre of the kit really, the centre of the model and that's going to all go in and then meet the, the top half of the fuselage and then the bottom half going in on top looks very clever, it's very clever so um, then we've got what is basically going to be the front end and the engine so this is, wow, oh, okay this, yeah, I've forgotten that they included engines and an access hatch. I've forgotten that because I never actually had the kit the first time um, as the Navy version. So, that, you know, you've got the, um, uh, the intake uh, fans here, fan blades, and then you've got your engines going in here, and then you're bringing in this sort of forward assembly as well. I um, hope it all fits together nicely. I'm sure it probably will. And then if you're building the model of the engine cover closed, you don't need to bother with any of this. Um, but then you've got a little bit of detail to put in on your engine some sort of piping, coolant and piping and then hydraulics and then another one of Paramjit's trademark uh, design features a mask so you put in this false cover you don't glue it, you just slot it in and then you can spray, do all your spraying um, and basically so you don't get any spray into your engine bay which you're going to have then open so you've got a completely separate masking uh, cover uh, which is very clever and yeah, the only thing I don't like about this, if I'm honest, the only thing I don't like... Now, I've heard people say it's not too bad, in fairness. But I don't like the idea you've got to... It looks like you've got to drill multiple holes to actually cut it out. I would prefer that to have been cut out for you as a, as a recess. Um, so, I'm not sure that's my favourite way that they've gone about it there, if I'm honest. Not a criticism, because I haven't built it. I don't know how well that'll go, but I think it would have been... It's a bit time-consuming and a bit tricky. I'd have preferred that to be a cutout already. Here we go. If you're going to have folded wings, um, you can do, 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 follow steps 48 to 54. That is where you're going to have the, the, the end section of the, the inboard part of the wing. Obviously, you just jump ahead to 55, don't do any of this if you're going to have them just straight out. Uh, you just go straight onto this bit where. Sorry, straight onto this section here. Uh, where it'll just be straight. I've got to be honest, would I have them folded uh, for an RAF version? Well, I've seen them folded at Arlington. They do sometimes. They did sometimes do it, but not very often because they didn't need to. I suppose it's another thing to go wrong if you don't need to fold them. You don't need to fold them, you know. Uh, but then you can see they've got this sort of strong, like a spar system uh, for strength and for helping it all fit together when you've not got the folded wings. And that's going to give you a nice plug in into the main. Uh, fuselage assembly as you can see there and then here you've got some you've got some areas where you're not going to glue now why is that do not glue because because you're going to have the hatches open I guess there it is hatches open I think perhaps they want you to glue that to right to allow correct alignment of the rear fuselage do not use glue on the surfaces highlighted in red Okay, so what? Okay, so it's just this. It's just don't run glue around here like you normally would. Now, I think that the idea, I suspect, will be that they want you to sort of click it together, and then you might have to just manipulate it ever so slightly. If you glue it, it won't work. Of course, it won't work. It'll sort of set, uh, and it might just need to be squeezed and manipulated a bit. Obviously, you just glue it in the normal way around the outside. So they're, they're wanting to give you a little bit of wiggle room. I think is the idea. And then over here we've got these open hatches, um, and this is towards the, this is at the front, is it? Yeah, this is at the front, near the leading edge hatch, so the, you've got this engine on display. Well, I think I'll be doing that, because <coughs> I'll be building this kit. Yes, I really will be building this one. Don't know when, but it will happen. For sure. As it's part of my background and history. <coughs> and then we've got a couple of holes, we've got the... Uh, the lower tail area here, you've got the tail, two tail halves going together uh, and the arrestor hook uh, recess there 
then you've got that tail coming into the back, slotting and plugging in. And you're going to plug in your front. Let's hope they're all a good fit, these parts, because uh, it could be tricky if they don't. We don't want any Revell type fitting, thank you. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, uh, you're going to bring in the, the main sort of engine uh, cowl, uh, intake cowl at the front. Uh, and then you've got this uh, separate intake ring. And another good idea from Paramjit, he's done this intake ring. So you can paint that separately and chrome it up. Because they're like a chromed finish. Uh, well, they were polished aluminium actually, but it look, looked quite chromed. Uh, but that means it's easy to paint, you don't have to mask it, you just paint it separately and then stick it in there. Then here you've got your tailpipes. Um, which I think are hollow. Yes, they are hollow. Which they weren't. Well, yes, they were little ones. Just checking. And then we've got our little flaps, landing flaps. Um, and then you've got your, you've got quite very small landing flaps. It has to be said in terms of size. And then you've got your ailerons coming in here on both sides, complete with the control rod. And then you've got your all-moving tail or tail plane, I should say, elevator, if you will, at the top, like a T-tail. Uh, and it's just worth making a point about this, that this, this area here, that goes on the top here, this, this was subject to a lot of uh, changes in design. Because when they initially developed the Buccaneer, there was a heck of a lot of, you can see this on documentaries, a heck of a lot of aerodynamic, uh, they were having vibrations, really bad vibrations. I think they had a, a tail fail, I don't, I don't think anyone was killed, but they did have a, a failure. Uh, and they had to modify it, and it was to do with the aerodynamics around this tail section. And what they did, they they basically added this front and rear section, which wasn't originally there, which is in this stage 88, shows it here. It's like a, an extended fairing at the front and at the back. And this took away this vibration, it sort of altered the centre of pressure and, and stopped the problem. So it just shows to, goes to show how much trial and error is needed with these aircraft. In terms of development. Then we're getting into the um, the rear speed brake, uh, which is quite tricky and a very, very very odd design. When I was a child and I saw these, I thought, what on earth is? I've never seen a speed brake like that before. That's this split tail, which is a very clever design. Again, very effective, and you know enables them to reduce its overall length by having it open. Um, so that's quite a complex, um, quite a, um, intricate, you might say, uh, assembly. Plenty of opportunities for a bit of weather in here because they're always filthy whenever I saw them. Um, and, and if you don't want to, you can have it closed obviously here and just have the straight straight tail comb section there. And then over on then we're over onto the bomb bay then. And this has got this rotating bomb bay cover. Uh, now I don't think it actually physically rotates like it did on the 72nd scale kit back in the 70s and this version. It's either on or off. And when it's not, when it's off, it's as though it's rotated in, effectively. And then we've got our um, main gear, big beefy gear on the Buccaneer, front and rear. Uh, and then you've got your gear doors going in there, all your wheels and tyres go together. Looks like we've got weight on wheels, which is absolutely brilliant. And, yeah, some really nice, show, again, Zokimura influence there. I don't know whether Paramjit's built some Zokimuras, but he's certainly acting like he has, because he's showing you clarity about the angles that things should be at. Look at that. It leaves you no doubt at all. That's very good. Excellent. And then we've just got things like our um, uh, pitot heads, and uh, there's a, I think it's a, a probe, a radar probe that they have on the leading edge there. And then you've got your arrestor hook coming in here, which, of course... Sometimes it can be used in emergencies, even on uh, conventional runways. You've got all of your uh, antennas going on, which I trust will be in the right place, I'm sure they will. It's not a kinetic kit. We've got a pilot! Okay. A bit nervous about the pilot because we saw the one on the gannet, well, the two on the gannet, th not three in fact, weren't there? Three. And they weren't great, I've got to be honest. No, not Airfix's best point in that kit, a bit of a low point. Perhaps best left out. But anyway, we shall see, keep an open mind. And then we've got our wiperless. Wiperless or wiper. Now, there was um, there was a thing with these buccaneers where some of them they didn't bother with wipers. I think they used to use Rainex on them. I think they, I think they had a blower as well. I think there's actually a blower ahead of the actual central windscreen. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, pardon me. <coughs> oh dear. Oh, I haven't got a cold. Just a bit of dust. <coughs> 
Um, yeah, so you've got an option of wiper or wiperless. Whether you actually... Uh, okay, so... Oh, no, okay. I'm, I'm talking rubbish. It allows the option of a photo etch wiper to be added. Wow. I'll probably go with the wiper version, actually. But some aircraft of this era actually had blown windscreens, didn't they? I think the Tomcat is like that, isn't it? Anyway. Um, and then you've got the, um, the option of the open or closed canopy. And of course you've got your refueling probe, uh, various radio, uh, high frequency radio receivers and transmitters. All sorts of sensors here that are going on the centre of the, that rear of the tail. Then you get into your weapons, you've got Sea Eagle. It's a heck of a beefy missile, I've got to say, a real monster. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's almost like a cruise missile. It's almost that big. It's really huge. Um, and then we've got those going on, or we've got the option of our bombs, of course, in the bomb bay. We've got the slipper tanks, starboard or port. And then Sidewinder missile, Sidewinder 9, uh, probably 9L, I think. Uh, and then you've got your Paveway 10,000 pound bomb. Most kind of bomb. And of course the Buccaneers acted as, um, with their laser designator sets here, they actually acted as the laser guidance um, sort of uh, pathfinder, if you will, for the tornadoes in the Gulf War in Operation Granby as well. Then we've got our ladders, which look really good. I've got to say, they look really cool, don't they? Yeah, they look quite intricate. And they clip into the actual side of the, of the body as well. Then you've got your FOD covers, which I'm really pleased to see that included in the kit. Those look excellent. Something that most manufacturers should do, I think, on these jets. And then you've got the option of having your, if you have any folded wings, that you fold them up and pop them in. There we go. So, then we're just on to our stencil positions, and there's a lot of them. How many have we got? 142? Oh, gosh. Quite a few. Oh, no, there's more. <coughs> oh, no, there's more, depending on which version. 158? Oh, 186? Oh. Depending on which version, which which variant. So beware C. C has got 186 stencils. Oh my lord. <laughs> I think that's it. There's slightly less on D. So there we are. So, what do we think of that? Well, yeah, excellent instructions, aren't they? Clear as, clear as a bell, to be honest. Nothing, nothing I saw there makes me think what the hell they're talking about. Quite the opposite. Couldn't be clear. So, let's have a go at this then. Now, what have they done here? Now, Airfix, your bags are massively too big. However, in your defence, you have crimped them in such a way that the, the sprue doesn't do this. They've, they've been crimped fairly close in to the actual... Um, what's my knife gone? There it is. They've been crimped in relatively close to the sprue itself, which is a good thing. So let's just see if I can put my way in here. Oh, and we've got clear parts as well. So why don't we start with the clear parts? <laughs> just in case they are, we, we don't want to get our hopes up only to have clear part fail at the end. <coughs> I'm not, that's not a comment against Airfix, that's just a general comment. It happens all the time when I do these reviews. Get to the end and then we realise there's a bit of an issue with the clear parts, just when everything else has got swimming. So, let's start with them. Clear parts. Oh, they're very, very nice. Very, very nice. My zoom, I shall show you. Here we go. Those are really, really, really nice actually. And they've gone for this thing where the tips of the wings, they've gone and got them as clear. So that enables you to, to mask off to get the little lights in the tips. Um, that's interesting. We've got this with and without a wiper option. I don't really understand that actually. As they're not providing clear uh, photo etch, I don't know why they've done that really. But anyway, it's always good to have a spare, isn't it? No complaining. So, are they are they clear? There's, there's a little distortion, if I'm honest. Um, 
th th there's a crispness and a clarity, but there's also like a slight, a slight distortion. But we are talking about you know a complicated aircraft with uh, bubbly, you know, very heavily formed canopy. Here you've got the deck cord option with or without. I'm sure, that's coming out too well on the camera. See, and there's the deck cord, and over here you've got the option without it. Is that a decal as well? I'm just going to check. Do we have a decal for the deck cord? I can't recall it. Hold on. Hold on, hold on. Just getting the decals out. What's there a deck cord decal? Not what I can see. I'm not entirely sure why they've done that then. It's not included. Mm -mm -mm -mm. No, not like I see. Not any deck cord there. That remains a slight mystery, to be honest. Um, anyway, uh, perhaps they were. Well, would they not have a deck cord on it? I find that strange. Maybe that's an earlier thing. I, I've got a feeling that I might be handling this. Um, Clear sprint, it might be <coughs> sort of universal with the earlier Navy version. Perhaps that didn't have deck cord, not sure. Um, a bit baffled by that. There's that slight mark on this, I don't know if you can make this out. There's a tiny mark here, just where my finger is. On the inside or on the outside? It's on the outside, it's a slight scuff. Slight scuffing. And I've got to say, on the one that's got the deck cord, there is quite a lot of, being fair, there is a fair bit of distortion, can you see it? Around, around the deck cord. Yeah. I'm not sure if my, um, I'm not sure if my Kits World set comes with a deck cord, does it? No, I don't think it does. I don't think so. It's looking, no. I can see. Nope. Anyway, <clears throat> so that's a bit of a mystery. Um, but yeah, especially from the top, if you look down like you are now, it's not that clear either side of that deck cord. It does seem to have disturbed the disturbed the mould. Um, interestingly, though, if you look at the deck cord itself, can you see how it's actually um, offset. The one at the back is slightly offset to the right and the one at the front is slightly offset to the left. That is to slightly eject them, I think, at different angles so that it, it bursts the canopy in a different way front and rear. That's quite interesting, isn't it? Can you see that? It's not straight down the middle. Yeah? Interesting. Well, um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I go with that deck cord option. I'm, I'm trying to think in my head what I'm gonna, how I'm gonna get around that. Actually, <coughs> I don't know. Uh, does it actually show in the other? I'm not gonna dwell on that at the moment. Let's just get into the plastic. We'll, look, we'll worry about that later. So here we have got. Now this is this new plastic that Airfix are using in the plant in India, uh, which is a much darker grey. Um, I yeah, quite like it in the, as much as that it is good, it's easy on the iron. I think the camera will like it as well. You can see detail better on this. If you recall the other week I had the Zukimura, <laughs> the kit of the year it turned in. Uh, but it was very light plastic and it was very hard for the camera to focus and it was hard for my eyes to focus. <coughs> plastic was amazing but it was, an, it was an odd choice, the colour, it was so light, you know. Let's have a look at these. So. Here's the tail. Yes, it's quite um, it's quite a dark grey, isn't it? It's sort of like a battleship grey colour, really. Yeah, quite like it though. But I do just wonder, you know, you can see here how they've got this um, the cutout for the the option of the engine open engine panel. So there are these sort of pre they look almost pre-drilled aren't they but they're kind of uh yeah i don't know why they couldn't have had that as a separate cutout really 
Yeah, you can work around it, it's not the end of the world, but it's just a bit, a bit of work required, I think. I'm going to have to be very careful. Need to watch what we're doing with that. <coughs> Here's we got the um, the tub for the cockpit. <coughs> Excuse me. Got the intakes there, and got the other intake on the other side over here. It looks very clean, doesn't it? It's no flash. There is some on the sprue, but not in the part. That looks cool. I should say that there is a tiny bit of flash. I don't need to see it on that nose on the, the left side, the uh, what is the starboard side. Compare the two, you can see it, can't you? Just it wants a little bit of a, a swipe, I think, rather than anything else. But then we've got these um, lovely Bombay, uh, and those are not ejectors, circles are not ejector pins, folks. Don't ask me what they are, but I know they're on the real aircraft because I've seen them. <laughs> um, I think they're just like little hatch covers where they can plug in different things. Um, and that's obviously where your bomb goes, or bombs. And we've got our <coughs> intake and exhaust pipes. Um, sorry, there are all the exhaust pipes, I mean in internal and external of the exhaust pipes at the back. Here we've got our um, speed brake in the open position. Means you don't have to faff around because it's already fixed, you don't have to faff around with it. Trying to get the angle right, which you did on the old kit. Real nightmare that was. And then over here, we have got the top of the fuselage. I'm sure many of these parts are the same, really, or very similar to what they were on the, uh, <coughs> on the Navy version. Um, but that's a nice sprue, there's nothing wrong with that one. So I'm going to just grab that and pop it back in its bag. <coughs> you just excuse me for one second. That's sprue A. And they have this sort of... Um, uh, like a sign on it saying A, which is very Academy-like, isn't it? <coughs> and then we've got all the different options for... We've got the... Speed brake options, we've got all of these um, uh, little spar like spar sets that fix and hold the uh, the engines. Now uh, we've got the pilots, let's 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 get let's get the elephant in the room out of the way. Well uh, they look a bit better than the Gannet ones, if I'm fair. I think they are a little bit better than the Gannet ones. Still not brilliant, if I'm honest. Anybody that's seen the the Tamiya, uh, the Tomcats, or the F-35s will know exactly straight away what I'm talking about. But they're not bad. They seem better to me than the Gannett ones did. They don't look quite as melted. It's a bit sharper. And we've got some detail here on the panelling. Which is in the... Uh, is that the cockpit or is that in the... I don't think where that is. Is that in the gear bear thing? Here we've got our bulkhead, back of the cockpit, and then we've got the spar, and then we've got our engine. <coughs> now that looks really cool, spay engine. So these are the same engines as in the Phantom, aren't they, if I'm not mistaken? Well, am I correct? I think I am. And uh, no I'll plenty of power, eh? <laughs> but it just doesn't have reheat on it, it doesn't have the afterburner function that the Phantom has. Because uh, they were heavy enough, the <laughs> Buccaneers. So here you've got these uh, these engine intake sort of spar arrangement that fixes it all into place and acts like a, almost like a jig for holding the uh, the top and bottom fuselage halves together. Then you've got your intake uh, fans there, front of the engine. Then you've got the one at the back of the engine, similar sort of spar setup. Uh, and again, and there's the third one, right at the right at the back, or oh, sort of halfway down, halfway down, I think. And we've got some nice detail here. <coughs> and this is at the back near the um, air speed brake, I think. And you've got this internal, this is this internal uh, system for the, the weighting, putting your weight inside like a capsule. And that's the back plate for it, which is 
a great idea from Pramjit. Well done, sir. I think we all appreciate that one. Well, that's a very nice sprue, I've got to say. No complaints again, and that engine looks sufficiently detailed. It's very nice indeed. Yeah, and I say even the pilot's a little bit better than I was anticipating. I was really holding a breath for those, but they don't look too bad to me. Let's go and it in. That's that one. That's one bag of three. A second bag. Let's have a look at our weapon sprues. These sprues are just absolutely huge, aren't they? They're almost bigger than Tommy Art. It comes in a big box as well, doesn't it? It's quite imposing, really. Right, um, we'll do the small one first. No, we'll do the big one first. The big one first. Um, well, this is where we've got our weapons. We've got our Sea Eagle, we've got some of the business end of the aircraft, we've got our slipper tanks, we've got um, top of the uh, tail there. Oops. Top of the tail there, the arrestor hook area here. It's better, isn't it? There we go. And then we've got these sea eagles, which are, as I said, they're blooming huge, but I like the way they've done it. Look at that. Yeah, they've formed those in a nice way. Instead of having to put individual fins on, they've gone and pre-formed the, the area that's got the fins on. is in a separate subsection, look. With the front and the rear fins all together, that's cool. I like it. Got very nice looking sidewinder missiles as well. The engraving and the moulding here is really good, really excellent, very fine. Look at those, um, look at those front fins on the sidewinder. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? That's really, really nice. Very, very nice indeed. Laser guided bomb again. Lots of good panel line detail there. And then we've got our <coughs> many, many. Um, we've got all sorts of fins and uh, uh, here we've got the pylons and here we've got another laser guided bomb it's peeping out there. Here we've got the bomb bay door itself and then we've got our um, laser guidance, laser designator system here. Slipper tanks Yeah, that's an absolutely massive sprue, isn't it? And then we've got the the bigger, I think this is for the Sea Eagle, because they need a big, meaty, uh, and it's two-sided as well, which is nice. A big, meaty pylon for Sea Eagle. Really cool, that. Lots of great detail on them, isn't there? Yes, I like it. That's a... <clears throat> Proper huge old school sprue. <laughs> That's massive. That's the decided it's cheaper to um, have one big sprue than lots of small ones. Okay, next one. It's a bit small this time, about half the size in fact. Uh, and this is sprue frame number G. And this has got things like uh, gear bay doors, which look beautifully detailed. Yeah, look at that. Very, very nice indeed. You've got all your, uh, your trunk in, you've got your gear legs, you've got your weight on wheels, which look very, very nice, don't they? Weight on wheels, tyres and wheels here, with a bulge in them. Yeah, that's cool. Like it. Main gear legs, which as I said on the Buccaneer are ultra beefy undercarriage on the Buccaneer, big heavy aircraft. I'm sure we said that when it weighs, I think they weigh about 14 tonne or something, it's quite a lot. <coughs> Is it more than that maybe? So probably a guess that was. Don't take me at my word. <laughs> um, here's the ejection seat, Martin Baker, Martin Baker ejector seat. Uh, are they Mark 9 I think, are they? I can't remember. From memory, I think they're Mark 9 and Mark 10. 
and you've got the head headrest pads here which look very nicely done and then you've got your pull uh, ejector pull handles uh, which of course ejects and blows the canopy if it's got the deck cord in it your seat cushion there and you've got all these little bits of the instrumentation um, panels at the side either side of the the crew and all the buttons on it and controls this is the one where you've got one or two decals to go on here which might be a little bit fiddly but they're nicely moulded aren't they <coughs> and here we've got the instrumentation instrument panel I think that's the pilot's instruments is it or am I wrong? Is that the back one? Might be the navigators, I'm not quite sure. I'm not used to this level of detail. <laughs> and you've got the uh, uh, display screen, like a radar screen there. And then you've got your coving on top of the instruments there. Plus you've got your nose wheel and tyre. That part here that's got an arrow in it to help you, so you know which way around it goes. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. That's that one. And then we have this one, which is H. And this has got a lot of the fine parts in it, so I'll just take my time a little bit on here so you can get the focusing. Some really fine stuff going on here. Look at that, trunking and conduits. Here we've got that um, access door for the engine. And then we've got all sorts of piping and uh, uh, mechanical uh, linkages, which I think is for the gear bay doors, I think. <clears throat> you get your FOD covers, foreign object debris, those are nice aren't they, I like those, those have been really nicely moulded, all the rivets in them. This has got all the fine parts on it hasn't it, you've got a pito, pito head there, which on the buccaneers on the port wing, and then you've got the mechanism here for the arrestor hook at the back, a couple of more sensors and pito heads. Here you've got those uh, front and rear fairings on the tail I talked about, which stop that vibration problem that they had in development. Gosh, some really fine mould in there, and there's the arrestor hook. Isn't that nice? Yes, I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah, I think it's going to build into a heck of a buccaneer, is this? One more bag to go. So far, so good. The only thing I picked up on really was that this thing with the deck cord on the um, clear part on the canopy was a bit, a bit of distortion there. Nothing too serious. And last but not least, we're into the wings and tails and things. So, there we go. Last two. So, first of all, wings. Oh yes, these are lovely. These are nice. Look at the detail on the panel lines here. This has got this blown... Um, didn't really go into any detail about that though, did it? It's, um, it's worth having a look on Wikipedia. It explains this blown engine-driven air that they blow to enhance the... You know, use the coander effect to uh, create this greater... Basically, it's to create stability at low speed when they come into land. It gives them more lift, effectively. It's a simple way of explaining it. A bit more lift. <clears throat> and you've got your uh, flow generators here. Um, sorry, vortex generators, I should say. Um, but of course, the, the, this air would be blown as a leading edge. The air would be blown from the leading edge over those. Um, high pressure air from the engine to give lift, it just enhances the lift of the aircraft so it can land a lot slower than it would otherwise be able to do. And there's your ailerons, you've got your ends of your wings here when you've got the uh, when you've got the uh, the wings folded, wing detail, and then there's those 
like a spa for the wing when it's closed. And then over here we've got our tail, tail plane assembly. You've got this great big assembly here for the uh, speed brake at the back, <coughs> actuators. You've got your flaps. Um, that's, that again is the speed brake, outer shroud for the speed brake. Very nice. Very nice indeed. And then last but not least we have Sprue D, which is all of the stores. So we've got all your bombs, here's your conventional, I think these are, what did they say they were, ten, say £10,000 bombs? £10,000, not sure about that. I thought they were £500 bombs, but anyway, uh, I shall not argue with them. But then you've got these, again, you've got these lovely, um, on the sea eagles, you've got these, again, these inserts with all of the fins. I think they've done this really well, it's very clever. Paramjit's thought about it and thought, well, maybe we can't afford slide moulding and frames and all that stuff that Great Wall Hobby did. Well, they don't do it now, do they? I don't know why they've changed. But this is a really good compromise, pre-moulding all the fins. That takes hours of work out of the problem, doesn't it? Not just the work in terms of the effort and the hours, but the potential to go wrong is removed. And then here we've got all our... Uh, The ALQ pod, I can't remember now. <coughs> and, uh, and that's beautifully formed as well. Uh, you get part of your slipper tanks, and then you've got. Yeah, interesting uh, interesting weapons there. Just thinking what that was. Is this the same frame that we use on the, the Navy version, I wonder? Just wondering. I'm going to check back in my instructions because I'm a little bit baffled. Let's just go back here. Just bear with me a second. I just want to check what it's actually saying about those. Do, do, do. Sea Eagle. They can't all be Sea Eagles, can they? There's too many of them. Don't get that. There seems to be a lot. The shape is wrong. I don't think that is used on this model, actually. Sea Eagle. It doesn't look like the right shape at the nose for Sea Eagle. I think we had Sea Eagle earlier on, didn't we? Pretty sure we did. Yeah, Sea Eagle's a lot blunter, so that's something else. So I think we just ignore that one. And then you've got all your pylons over here. Um, and that's kind of it, really. So, yes. Um, it's going to be night and day better than that old kit, isn't it? It's just, just the horror. Oh, bad on so many levels, you know. One of the all-time worst airfix kits in my view. Uh, again, one of those kits that you open, and go, oh, that's great, that's going to be cool. And you start building it and then you realise everything is, is horribly walked out of shape and this is just state of the art, isn't it? That's very, very nice. So. What do we think about it then? Um, any criticisms? Well, uh, just I'm a little bit confused about those uh, weapons at the end because they clearly weren't sea eagles. Um, a later uh, weapon. Um, but apart from this deck cord question, which is a little bit confusing, isn't it? with or without the deck cord. I suppose you could paint your own deck cord. I did want to do that, I'm not, I'm not sure. That's a little bit confused for me. Uh, I didn't see it, in, I did see it in the decals, and so I missed it. But, I just do it without, you know, do it without. Um, I don't recall them having deck cords on when I was there, that was early days, um, at the time. The idea with it was that you just, you know, open the canopy and it flew back, of course. Um, so maybe they added the deck cord as a later thing, or whether it was added for the Gulf War, I'm not quite sure actually. But it's a beautiful, beautiful kit, yeah, and it does 
yeah, I think that hits the spot of what I was hoping for. Um, slight reservations about that, those clear parts, but apart from that, really, nothing I really that jumped out at me as being a problem at all, really. Very nice instructions, Paramjit's design, lots of things in there to try and help with the construction and make it clear, make it go together well. You know, this idea of clipping in these sections of the nose, either side of the nose fuselage, click, click. Some great stuff in there. So I think I'm going to give that. Uh, I'm showing favouritism here because I like the book on it. I was going to say I'm going to give it 9.75 out of 10. And I think, I think that's where I'm at. I think that's where I'm at. I've not built it. This is an inbox review. But I'm going to go with 9.75 out of 10, which I think might be the highest score I've given an Airfix kit, actually. I'm not sure. I can't remember back to the, the, the Vulcan, but there were some issues with the Vulcan with the fit, I know. And I've got a feeling it got a lower score. I think it was 9, 9 and a quarter, something like that. I don't think that's, that's unreasonable. Everything's nice. Um, the only one criticism I will say, uh, which I haven't mentioned at all about this kit, is the price. It's not a cheap kit, this. Not a cheap kit. And I've forgotten this. It's, I paid 70, just shy of £73. It's quite a lot of money. It's quite a lot of money. Um, when it was announced at this price, I, was, I remember wincing and saying, 60, 65 pounds would have been to me 65, yeah. Once it got beyond 70, no, I think that's a bit too much. So I think I'm going to retract and just slightly say nine and a half out of ten because it is a bit pricey. It is pricey, you know. I mean, you've got Tamiya kits okay at the same scale, but that are only 15 pounds, 20 pounds more, but are kind of on a different level in, in, in so many respects and so much extra features. Not a criticism of this one though, but I just feel it was a shy, a, a little bit too expensive at 70, 73 pound, no. Should have been in the 60s, it should have started with a six, the price really. So I'm gonna go nine and a half out of 10, which I think, oh, now I've given you the reasoning, I think that's fair. I think you probably agree, most of you anyway. So there we are. So yes, we had a bit of trouble getting our hands on it. Less said about that, the better, enough said really. Um, but now it's here, yes, perhaps it's done a fine job with it. Uh, it's a great subject, much underrated aeroplane. These things were fast. When you saw them at low level, the, it was terrifying, you know. They used to do, uh, the air show at Honington, they used to do these low level bombing runs. Uh, albeit with um, explosives on the ground to simulate a bombing run. It was proper scary there, I tell you. And they come in, they sort of come out of nowhere over the treetops and just sweep in at crazy speed, 600 mile an hour. Very, very frightening and very, very impressive aeroplanes. Much underrated. I mentioned about going to school across the road, and that, that school, of course, I've told this story once before. I'll mention it again now because it's, uh, it might bring a smile to one or two of you. Uh, I, I used to go to school at the uh, Honington Primary School. <coughs> the Buccaneers would be flying over all day. And then on a Friday afternoon at uh, half past three, we had to get out very quickly and be gone by 3.45 because the Dad's Army uh, TV series film crew used to arrive with all the cast at about a quarter to a quarter to four, four o'clock, start filming Dad's Army. <laughs> Not every week, but it was a regular venue um, and it was used in several episodes, including the captain's car, the one with the two Rolls Royces, and um, the honourable man, my Sergeant Wilson, um, is, uh, gets confused as a motorbike and gets confused as being the, the chief in charge by the visiting fr uh, the Russian dignitary. Uh, and it was used quite a lot anyway, that, that, that um, filming venue was used a lot because it was very oldy worldy, very beautiful. So if you uh, just go and have a look at those uh, two episodes and you'll see, you actually see where Wilson is trying to get his motorbike started. And they drain the petrol out of it and all this business to, out of, sorry, they drain the petrol out of Hodge's car for Wilson's, um, sorry, Hodge's motorbike. They drain, they turn it upside down, Pike does, and he drains petrol so that Wilson's got some petrol and that's all done right outside my old school so there you go so and they actually walk out from the in front of the window of the class where I learn to read would you believe there you go a bit of a personal history tool for you so Buccaneers very close to my heart nine and a half out of ten in the end I say 9.75 if it'd been cheaper it would have got 9.75 I think another five or ten pounds off the price would have definitely got it a little bit higher but it's there's nothing wrong with it it's just just a bit expensive you know 
So there we go. So Airfix finally did get it to us in the end and it was worth waiting for. Um, and yeah, most impressed. That will be built by me because you can see that I need to pension that off to the local charity shop really. Look at that, it's trying to, it's trying to sit, isn't it? It's trying to sit back on its uh, blue tacks, not quite doing the job. Look, I've got, I've got movable, I've got the movable uh, speed brake, air brake at the back. <coughs> anyway, I hope you thought it was interesting. I'll try to get you the review as quickly as I could. Thank you very much for watching. Um, and we will have some more stuff coming up in the near future. Um, we've got some lovely new kits from ICM to show you. Um, so stay tuned and uh, we'll have lots more for you in 2024. In the meantime, until next time, thanks very much for watching. Stay well, stay safe. Thanks for all your time and bye for now.